I'm crying because it's it's no longer painful. It's actually joy. It's like wow, because I get to play the tape back again. And so it's like I'm I'm proud that I'm here. You know, it took a lot, and I had to do the work because a lot of times we don't like to, we don't have the willingness to do the work. And I realized that anything great worth having, you have to work for it. Yeah. You know, and I believe that I was worth it, so I fought for me. Hey y'all, hey y'all, what's going on? Welcome back to the Stacking Days podcast. This is your host, Ray Donovan, as always, coming back at you with another interview. And I'm pretty excited about the conversation today for a few different reasons. One uh, is because uh, our guest that we have today is someone who is in, in long-term recovery. So I feel like there's quite a bit that we can learn from the story. Uh, but in addition to that, a little dissimilar to how we usually do things. I know we talk specifically about alcohol being our substance, but I believe today we're going to be talking more about about drugs. So a little bit of a, a, a change there you know, with the substance variable, but I think that what you'll find is that there are a lot of similarities in terms of what, uh, what our guest has gone through in order to kind of get over the substance and some of the tools uh, that she's brought to the table in order to continue to sustain herself over this uh, longer uh, term sobriety and recovery. So without further ado, I want to introduce Lunik uh, to the mic and to the show. We're going to get into her story. So Lunik, thanks for joining me on the Stack of Days podcast. Absolutely, Ray. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me, by the way. Oh man, you, I'm I'm I can't wait. I've I've probably consumed a handful of of you know other conversations that you had over the the, the past couple of days. So I'm really looking forward to getting into into our our discussion today. And I guess you know let's start at the beginning. Uh, I feel like there's so much that we're going to cover, but mm-hmm. it all you know in terms of the subject matter of of stacking days. Let's go back to the beginning of your relationship with substances, how it came to be, and what role did it play in your life? And we'll kind of just move through chronologically, um, you know, from there. So, again, um, I'm happy to be here and, you know, happy to share my story. You know, when I play the tape back, right, because I'm I'm from a different era, right? When I play the tape back and I think about, you know, where all this happened, because a lot of times we don't like to go under the surface and we don't like to lift the rug up. We just like to pile stuff on top of stuff. When I really lift and unveil it, it really started, you know, with hanging out with my friends, sneaking out, lying to my parents, going over to New York um, and going over to the city and in the village. And, you know, we're promiscuous. We want to be cool and down with everybody else, losing our 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 identity, not really knowing who we are, trying to figure out who we are. So one of the things that was key for me was remembering how like we were experimenting life together for the first time, me and some of my friends. So it was like, oh, let's go to the liquor store and let's go get some beer. Or somebody would say, oh, my God, you know, so-and-so has marijuana. Try this. And they would show you how to roll it. And then you take a little puff, you start giggling, and you don't, you know, you, you take it for granted. And it's all in fun, right? Not realizing that, you know, I heard someone say to me a long time ago, they said, anything that you do or you consume recreational too long or too much of eventually becomes a habit. And it becomes something that becomes a part of you and something that you can't do without. Because what happens is your mind and your cell and your body becomes accustomed to those things and they cry out for it and they're always knocking and they are in need of it in order to function and be a part of who you are. So um, I thought that that was very powerful, but I didn't learn that until later. Um, But smoking marijuana and drinking beer and hanging out with my friends Um, in the village in New York was the first introduction to how all of this started, but it was all in fun. Like I said, never intended to continue to do this. It was always when I was with my friends and, um, and then the marijuana got, um, a little bit more intense and then it became something I enjoyed because you would giggle, you would laugh, you would relax. It would put you in a state of, you know, um, it, you know, it gave you a relaxation sensation yeah. and it was always available and someone always had it. 
You know, you didn't have to go out and pay for it. It was like a hangout drug. Um, the beer, you did have to go. The alcohol, you had to go and purchase it. And I wasn't even old enough, but every party I went to, the alcohol was always available. And if it wasn't available, um, we would get fake IDs because in the village back then you could get a fake ID, get your fake ID, and now you can go to the liquor store and you can buy what you want. Yeah. Not not to age you at, at all, but what era of like the village are we talking about here? Because I feel like for folks who pass through, you know, the southern part of Manhattan today. Oh, it's today, still like that looks- now. <laughs> okay. It's still like that now. Like my nieces, like they want to go to the village. They want to hang out. They want to go into Washington Square Park because it's the lifestyle, you know, like it's art. It's yep. artsy. It's museum. It's the fashion. You know, it's always been the place where people go to just kind of start having fun for the first time and sneaking out of the house. And they don't necessarily have to try to, uh, they don't need an ID to do things in the village. Yeah. Even in Manhattan on 42nd street, you know, people, the lights, the camera, they're drawn to those things. No, totally. I, I, I totally get that. So, so you're, so you're spending a lot of time, you know, in, in, in the city as, as it's called, if you're a Jersey or Connecticut or what have you. Um, and uh, and so what does that start to look like like for you then? I mean, you you obviously are, are experiencing life. Um, I don't think that's so dissimilar to, you know, to any kid, you know, who is in their, you know, in their mid to late teens trying to discover themselves. Right. What it, what's 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 the what's the trajectory then look like for you from there? Um, it was all fun and games until it got real. Um, getting in trouble for stealing my mother's car, going to a party. Um, while my mom was sleeping, I packed my friends in the car and, you know, we went into a nightclub. We got drunk. The bouncer let us in. Um, we didn't have IDs, but we were cute. You know, when you're cute, when you're a girl, you can kind of get away with a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff that guys couldn't get away with. Um, stole my mother's car, um, got busted the next day. I'm Caribbean. So my mother took a broom, a a brush to me, you know, woke me up, flew me, I jumped out the bed and I jumped, you know, into a taxi and I just went to my sister's college and stayed there for two weeks because I didn't want to take, am I allowed to cuss? Yeah, we're all explicit. (laughs) I didn't want to take that ass whooping. I get it. I I wasn't trying to deal with that ass whooping. So me and my brother fled because I took my little brother with me everywhere where he wanted to go. So, um, you know, and then we started hanging out in the city a little bit more. People started introducing us to different drugs, acid and, you know, mescaline. And um, we would go into like these house music clubs and just anybody, anything that would let us in. We were just having fun and enjoying life. And I never, and that wasn't the peak of like my addiction, but that's where it started, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that over the at this point, it's to you, it's just about exploration, right? It's, You're not... We're just having fun and we're exploring and it's only on the weekends and maybe once a week, we would like forge paperwork and sneak out of school and be on the train and in New York and then back before anybody could notice we were gone. Yeah. I feel like so many folks can, can sympathize with that. I, we were talking about before the show, for me, similarly, you know, when I was in, in, you know, a younger, a young man, I spent a lot of time outside of the home doing a lot of things that you're talking about as well. And, you know, you, in hindsight, you, you get it. But it, yeah. oh, at the absolutely. moment, you know, what I mean, you're not you're not recognizing this p- could potentially, you know, grow into a problem for you. Um, Mm -hmm. and potentially grow into a problem for the folks around you. So when did that exploration uh, turn into something a little less manageable for you? And you said it too, Ray. You said um, as a child wanting to be out of the house at a certain age, not realizing that that was what the escape was, right? And I think for me, my parents were going through a lot and you know, my parents separated when I was really young and, you know, my parents are Caribbean, they're Haitian. And so just being very structured in the household, certain things were like forbidden. So the sneaking out and all the things that I was doing, I was doing it because I wasn't allowed to have friends. I wasn't allowed to hang out. So I'm like, what are you trying to keep me from? You know, had I known (laughs) in hindsight, but, um, I think it spiraled out of control. Um, 
I, I'm not going to say it spiraled out of control. I was still having fun. I love smoking marijuana. I had it under control. It was never a drug. The alcohol or the marijuana was never the drug that took me out. Hmm. That was the stuff I did when I wanted to. I never chased alcohol. I never chased marijuana. That was just something I liked to do and I enjoyed doing it. But if I didn't have it, it wasn't the end of the world. And I wasn't going to do whatever I had to do to go get it. So yep. with that being said, I believe it was like... Um, the the very first time I tried cocaine, the euphoria that I received from that was like, what was that? I like that. Um, and the first time I tried it was with a girlfriend of mine who um, picked me up the next, was it the next? It was the next day. So um, I experienced, um, I was raped, right? And she was about the only person that I could talk to about it at the time. Um, so when she came, she was like, hey, girl, what you doing? I'm going to come pick you up. We're going to go to this club. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay. And I wasn't doing anything. And I was still kind of like in the shock phase of it. Yeah. And um, she picked me up. She had a $20 bill. And we was talking. And she, I, she was just doing it, you know, while she was driving. I, did, mm -hmm. I looked over and I didn't think nothing of it. Um, I wasn't judgy or anything like that. And then I think um, I was sharing with her. I was like, I have something to tell you. And then when I started to share what happened and she was like, girl, here, t take this. You'll forget all about it. Mm. And I was like, OK. And I seen her do it a few times. So I took my pinky and I put it in a $20 bill. And there I was, you know, and then we went into the club and the music was whatever. My nose was wide open. And I'm just like eyeballs is bulging. And we kept going in and out the bathroom and that's what it became, you know? And then, um, at night after night, she would come get me. So now I became her hangout partner, you yeah. know? And, um, a couple of times and she would invite more friends and I would, then we would, she would introduce me to other people. And then my best friend and her were already hanging out. And I didn't know that, that when they hung out, that that's what they were doing. And so I was like, she said, oh my, you know, so I almost said her name, Lord Jesus, so-and-so is about to come get us, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. She said, yeah, she told me you guys were hanging out last night. And I was like, oh, okay. And then it kind of just, you know, took a life of its own from there. And yeah. I think it got bad when um, I found myself finding out where to go get it on my own. Cause I didn't, you know, she's at work or she's busy. She has a life. And now this thing, I liked it because I liked how it made me feel. It yep. made me not think about it. It made me um, just kind of just took me out of my my daily thought process. And it was just me burying it because I didn't want to deal. And I didn't kind of know how to deal with what was going on with me and what took place. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I, mean, I know that you shared this before, but I just want to highlight how, you know, how traumatic I'm sure that that event was for you and for any of the listeners out there listening to this um it, you know i've got a handful you know i got a bunch of sisters myself i got a daughter you know what i mean mm -hmm. so whenever I, when i hear things like that i i just i i start to feel something inside of me here mm -hmm. and and the 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 fact that you know because you didn't have the skills because you didn't have the support the resources the circle where you lean to be able to cope with that degree of trauma and pain was to cocaine and it was provided by someone that you know as a friend of yours, I mean, I think it just really speaks to, you know, the environment that some of us are in, right? And mm -hmm. again, I'm sure you didn't know at the time what that ultimately was going to grow into um, for you, but it did Absolutely. what you needed it to at the time, right? Which is like, give you some reprieve from this, like some of this, this experience that you had that you didn't know where to place and, and, and how Correct. to manage it. Because for me, marijuana was a relaxation. It was a downer. It yeah. was kind of like where I would have to sit and sit with it and think. And I, and I just didn't want to do that. And, I, and like I said, I think from that moment on, that first feeling of, of whatever it made me feel, it became the thing that I chased. Hmm. Because it's really in the chase, you know, trying to get that same feeling that you had the very first time. Yeah. Yeah, I I certainly remember the, er, the the first couple times that I that I drank, you know, when I was a kid, and I don't think I ever got that feeling back. Different feelings, but never got that. Yeah, feeling you never back, do. You know, yes. 
<laughs> so, 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 I mean, so now you're, you're, you're self-medicating yourself, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to find this space of euphoria to protect your emotions from, you know, some, some just real shit. Um, you know, what is the next, the next, you know, part of the journey look like for you then? I mean, is it, was it something that was manageable for you or was it? In the it, beginning, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It became manageable. It was manageable in the beginning. And my best friend, um, you know, some people just have really heavy addictive behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, it wasn't that for me in the beginning. And I didn't know that that's what it was for her. And it was like, no matter what day it was, no matter what time it was, it was time to do that. Yeah. And because she was my best friend and because she was my roommate, it would be like, we would be cool. You know, we'll be drinking and hanging out. And then she'd be like, I want, I'm ready to go to the city. What time are we leaving? And I'm like, where are we going? Are we going to New York. Okay. And I'm not to blame her, but I feel like, you know, there's always someone driving the wheel. And I think it was more like, um, it takes two to tango. I'm going to say that. I was the driver. I was the fearless one. I was the one that could get in the car and wasn't afraid to drive to New York instead of taking the train and all of that. And she knew that, you know, and it was like, we were like frickin' frack. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were getting high like every day. It turned into an every single day thing. We were funding it via scams. We were funding it via full-time jobs. We were funding it through part-time jobs and hustling and whatever else, you know, we could get our hands on. But we were like, it was always available. And of course we were girls. We would roll up to New York and be like, Poppy, I'm going to give it to you next week or I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. And they would front us drugs every single day. Um, and then a friend of mine, um, God rest the dead. Um, so they started putting the, the cocaine in cigarettes and it was just all like people would hang out. Everybody did like different things, used it in a different way. And yeah. then it was a thing where they would put it inside the, the, the weed, you know, they would take the cocaine and they would put it inside the weed and they would call it, uh, what they call it woolas. They would put the coke in the weed and they would smoke it and they would have this like certain slow burn. And that's what we all did, you know? And then it was always like 10, 15 of us. And it was always like, oh, so we're, someone's house was always hosting these events. Never my house, because never her house. We were, we went to New York, we were going to New York and he said, okay, when you guys come back, just stop at my crib. So we stopped at his house and... For the first time, he goes, why are you guys wasting this? We were like, what do you mean wasting it? He was like, I'm going to show y'all something new. Y'all don't, don't really know how to get high. Hmm. He was like, what do you mean we don't really know how to get high? We're getting high every day. So he took the cocaine into the kitchen and he had this little pot and he started cooking up the cocaine and it had this smell to it. And I was like, what the heck is that? And you can't see it, but I have this like little circle burn on my nose of course and <laughs> yeah I took the spoon it was hot and I didn't know it and so I put the spoon to my nose so I could smell it he was like what are you doing I was like ah I burned myself so till this day it, it's very like you can't see it but yeah. I know it's there and it's Just very a, subtle a little, little memento a little memento <laughs> yeah it's a little tattoo yeah and um you know it was there and I was like, ah, so the whole time my nose is like burning. So we go get ice and then I'm walking around looking like Rudolph for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Can't tell nobody where I got it from. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he, he cooked the cocaine and he put it in the marijuana and that set me. That became my drug of choice. Hmm. Hmm. And then he showed us in New York where to go get it already ready so we don't have to do all of that so we would take this ride and he's like oh he's introduced us to the, to the locations and the feeling that it gave me i chased that same feeling i never wanted to just put i would never put regular cocaine in my weed again i would never smoke weed without it in my i would never it, i stopped drinking because drinking wasn't my drug of choice yeah. and neither was marijuana and this is just um, doing it for you oh that was it well. And it was horrible. It was a horrible feeling of like afterwards, like because you're you're you, you can't speak, you can't talk, your mouth is is glued and 
you, you can't be around anybody. Mm-hmm. You, it's it's a crazy jittery. It makes you paranoid. It's so insane. Yeah. It's insane. It's I mean, the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> there's no there's no rationale, right? When it comes to you know any of this stuff, it, like because at the end of the day, whether it's the the immediate effects or the right after the immediate effects or you know the days following. I feel like regardless of what your substance is, it's just it's just slowly degrading you and experience. Oh, it, my God. You know. I tell people today, honey, I don't look like what I've been through. Because if you saw me back there, you'd be like, that is not the same person. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, I was bet. probably 90 pounds wet. Really? Oh. <laughs> I posted the picture like back then and me now. People were like, who's that? I was like, honey, that's me. They're so what, like, no way. <laughs> so, so what are, so what are, so I, I mean, so at, at your worst then, when you're, when you're going into the city and you're walking up on folks 90 pounds wet, I mean, what are they thinking? They're just the dealers. They don't yeah, see me don't every care. day. I'm not part of their family. They don't care. They just want the money. Yeah. And um, you don't see the progression right away, you know, because you stop eating the way you do. It kills your appetite because um, it's something that you're doing like for hours at a time. And then when you come down off of it, you're sleeping. Yeah. And then when you sleep, you, I mean, when you wake up, you're doing the bare minimum and then you're going back to it again. This yep. was part, I had probably like uh, maybe $1,500 a week habit. Hmm. And sometimes it was more depending on, you know, who you were hanging out with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can understand, um, you know, certainly it, it, you know, puts you in a different space where you're not, you know, you're not taking care of yourself, I guess. Is that the, the, the easiest way? No, I was a functioning honey. I always got my hair done. I always well, got did. my nails done. I was always fly. I was that girl. I had 14 cars. Okay. Every time one conked out, I got me another. I always kept a job. I was always fly. My jewelry always had my hair done. Me and my best friend, we were always fly. That's why people couldn't understand. They're like, how is this happening? Mm. You know, um, and always had, you know, male relations, friends, friends with benefits, you know, okay. people that just looked out for us, took care of us. Um, and then at the end of the road, of course, they're like, yo, you need to chill. What are you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm just losing weight. I'm not eating as much as I want. I can, you know, um, I don't have an appetite. And you start to make these excuses and you wear big clothing because yeah. you don't want people to see that you've lost the weight. And then, at, you know, at some point you just stop looking in the mirror. Mm. I stopped looking in the mirror because I was when I did look in the mirror, I didn't like what I saw and I didn't recognize the person that I had become. And I just didn't like what that looked like. So I stopped looking. Got you. Mm -hmm. I could put I used to be able to put my eyebrows on without being in a mirror. I became a pro at putting on lipstick without a mirror. No, it's real talk. (laughs) That's wild, Joe. That's wild. (laughs) I mean, so so, so proficient. I mean, (laughs) at least that's wild. (laughs) <laughs> I thought it looked good but I always went to the nail salon manicure, pedicure and I used to have a lot of hair so my hair was always done like that was a must the exterior had to look good but meanwhile I was dying on the inside mm. yeah I mean so so tell me about that internal um, dialogue then right so you are obviously you know well kept externally but when did the inside catch up and start taking its fair share of the conversation that you were having with yourself? Like, when did it become start to become a problem that you had to figure out, to, you know, a way to address one way or the when other? I when I realized at the end of the road, my friend, my best friend uh, was diagnosed bipolar. And is this the same um, the same girlfriend, the that same you was, best friend. Okay. And then eventually she went into the hospital and was admitted And was diagnosed schizophrenia. Wow. Um, And I think there's some type of, like, it allegedly it runs in her family. And this is not me putting her to shame in any way. We are still in touch to to this day. We're better in touch now. We had parted for many, many years. And I love her. Um, We did so much together. She was my ride or die, you know. And uh, it hurts, you know, because... I'm like, but for the grace of God, there go I. And what I mean by that, for those that don't know, it means that could have easily been me. Mm -hmm. And she was a heavy cigarette smoker. 
but I wasn't. I smoked, but I didn't have to have a pack of cigarettes. Like it didn't have to be, you know, if she was, a, if she had three or four cigarettes left, she was made sure we were back at the store so that she doesn't run out. Right. I could literally run out of cigarettes, but it, you know, I think the question that you, can you just reiterate on that question one more time? I just yeah. got really emotional just now. No, no, no. I mean, and, and absolutely. I'm happy to, I guess what I, what I, I'm looking to understand is at what point did you start looking at your own situation and realize that you need to do some things differently, or maybe you didn't have the choice in that matter, but um, it certainly sounds like your friend was on her own journey and I'm glad that you're in contact now. Cause my question earlier was going to be, is that friend still around? It sounds like that they are, which, you know, yes. God, God, God mm-hmm. bless that they are. She lives in another, yeah, she lives in another state. And I think the, um, the turnaround was, I, I, um, not even the turnaround when I, when I realized the problem was really bad, it was at the end of the road when I found myself in my car going uptown by myself and getting high by myself. Gotcha. You know, the, the crowd, the smoke and mirrors cleared everybody that, you know, was taking from me because I always had money, you know, they were taking what they needed and I was all, you know, I would supply, you know, cause every, you get a turn who's supplying the, the drugs this week or today. Right. Um, and because I had to have it and because everyone knew where I lived and because everyone was already, you know, had a front row seat in my life, I couldn't hide. Mm-hmm. And I started to feel like I was being used. Um, that light bulb came on because every time we would go to the spot, nobody had money right. um, or it would be an excuse like, Oh, I'll give it back to you when we get to the house and we get back to the house. It's, Somebody stole my money. It was all, it was bad. Hmm. But at the end of the road, I believe it was when um, it got bad when I realized I was at the spot by myself. Um, And I was going to, I started to go by myself because my best friend started hanging out with another young lady who had graduated to another type of drug. Hmm. Um, And they were doing heroin. Um, And that was the, I was that like I said I don't like downers so when they were doing that I was off doing my own thing we were hanging out together doing the same thing because the other young lady she just passed away um for from heroin overdose I just found out maybe like six, six months ago um weren't I wasn't in touch with her but we were all hanging out doing the same thing but I noticed that they would be nodding off in the middle of a conversation and I'm like uh what's happening you know, and then I didn't like that part of it. So I just kind of went off on my own. So, I mean, what did that, what did that period of your life look like when you're up, uptown, you know, solo? I'm sure there was probably, I don't know if there was some, some nerves, some fear, uh, I, I would oh. imagine. <laughs> First of all, when you got to get what you got to get, fear takes the back seat. Yeah. I was going to say, you, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it, yeah, the addiction had a life of its own, honey. We feared nothing. Yeah. So you just went right <laughs> to the fire. <laughs> What? <laughs> we feared absolutely nothing. There was no fear. Let me tell you something. One time I remember, right? <laughs> oh, I can laugh about this now. So, Ray, thank I'm, I, thank God. I'm in my car. I go to the city. I, I go upstairs in the building. I cop my drugs and I come down. And before I hit the road, of course, I got to prepare one for the road, right? Because usually I just get in my car and I'm just like, once I got it, then the paranoia kicks in on my way home. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. But then it just, it was so normal. And I wasn't really scared about copping the drugs. I was just looking out for the cops. Right. Because they would run up in the spots. And one time the cops was in the spot. I went up to the spot and they were there. And I looked around. They were like, I said, oh, I was looking for uh, <laughs> Joe. They're like, yeah, get in this line. Oh, <laughs> you know? that's hilarious. Arrested me and everything. And then the guy, <laughs> but they let me go. It was so funny because I'm in the, just, that's another story. But I'm in, in the van and the guy was like, he looked at me and he knew I didn't, but like, it was just different. And he opened the door. He said, when I open this door, I want you to get out. Hmm. I was like, all right. He opened the door. I was, Phew. what did I do? I went to another spot, got my stuff, got my car and went home. But I come out, this is the story I wanted to tell you. So I'm in the car and I'm rolling up. And the cops roll up on me on the side with their, their flashlights banged on my window. Drugs in my lap. Oh, shit. Yeah, they asked me for the paperwork and told me that the car, um, I had owed probably thousands of dollars in parking tickets. Mm-hmm. 
because I, I had a, a job in New York prior to, and I used to get a lot of parking tickets that I'd probably, I'd never paid for. And they told me to get out the car, called the tow truck and told my car and left me standing there. I threw my hand up, jumped into a, a, a cab, uh, got in the back and I said, can I smoke in here? He said, yep. I lit it and I smoked it. He dropped me off at home, but I still had my drugs. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Everything, <laughs> everything was all good, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I That's can laugh wild. about, but it was—it's the insanity. Yeah, it's the insanity, and I actually got help for it. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's probably a good segue then. Talking about getting help for you, what it? So you going from you know to literally going into the fire, you know, to to make sure that you're you know getting what you need, and but at the same time you're realizing this is a problem, right? Is it, there's, there's nothing. Th- this whole oh, thing it was is definitely a problem. a problem. I would be arguing and fighting with my brother. I would be arguing with my family members. They're like, you got to get your together. What are you doing? Did they know what was going on with you? Did they know what was oh, going absolutely. on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Did they ever catch me in the act? Never. Mm. Um, I was either, because I always had my own place. So my brother did come to live with me, uh, but it was always while he was gone. Okay. Um, and... Um, my sister knew it was hard not to know because I went from 150 or 60 pounds to 90 pounds and I was an athlete. So my body's sick, like, you know, and they're like, what's happening? You know, my face is drawn, um, but I never stopped getting my hair, my nails and my feet done. That was always a thing because I thought if I did that, no one would know or they would. Everything felt normal if I did that. You know, that was like my little routine. And um, I think one of the wake up moments, too, was when someone set my car on fire. OK, tell me about that. please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you can't just drop. You can't just you drop. Can't just, you, not gonna <laughs> you, you can't just drop that, you know, in the middle of this episode. I think one of the wake up moments <laughs> was when someone set my car on fire. So let's take a pause yeah. there and let's talk about that specifically. What happened there? <laughs> Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. If you are, we'd really love it if you could leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcast or a rating on Spotify. And of course, please feel free to invite somebody into the conversation. If you feel like you have a story to share on the podcast, why not apply to be a guest? You can do so by completing the form on the podcast description or find it on stackingdays.com. That's S-T-A-C-K-N-D-A-Y-S.com. But for now, let's jump back into the conversation. So me and my my best friend, we had an apartment together. <laughs> he says, you're not going to. <laughs> Hello. Let's rewind that back. Yeah. So we're in the house Saturday, typical Saturday. Got the music playing. Because we always kind of just start off with just like a little bud, whatever. We're cleaning the house. And next thing I hear is boom, 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 boom. We're getting ready for our, you know, Saturday routine. And I hear, boom, 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 boom. hurry up, get out of the house, get out of the house. We're like, whoa, I thought that was, I was like, oh my God, that's the police. I'm thinking, you know, they're covered in raid. Somebody told them we got drugs in the house. Who knows? So she's banging, some banging on the door. So we run out and I go to push the door, but there's so much smoke and I can't. So we run out to the front of the house. Um, it was like, it was a one, it was a two family. Was it a two family? No, it was a one family house. So we run out the front and you could see the smoke coming from the back, like because the driveway was by the the garage was by the back door, mm. and they're like, "So your car's on fire! Your car's on fire!" I'm like, "What? My car's on brand new 929 Mazda, leather seats, infinity clock, Those you are know, nice. yeah." And I run out, and then my car's on fire. Next thing I hear is, and I look around, and I think that was probably my first reality check. And I was like, what just happened? I'm thinking maybe I left a cigarette burning on the car seat or something like that. And I looked down on the ground and gas um, container was still there. So I asked someone, are you guys going to take this? You're going to try to find fingerprints, blah, blah, blah. And then after the smoke cleared, I felt like I was in a complete daze. Like this didn't just happen. It felt like a nightmare because it's broad daylight. I'm like, it's broad daylight. It's not like nighttime or not that that makes a difference. But I'm like, it's broad daylight. It's Saturday afternoon. It's one o'clock. Who would set my car on fire? Yeah. So then they left and these two little boys were sitting on the porch next door. And um, something just said, go over there. So I walked over and I was like, I looked at them and put their head down. I was like, 
don't be scared. I just want to know. I said, that's my car. I was like, did y'all see anything? And the little boy said, yeah. He said, three guys with masks rolled up. One busted the window. One poured the gasoline in. The other one struck the match, and they ran that way. Damn. And I was like, oh. And you can't mistake in my car. That was my car. Like, I, to this day, I couldn't. It was it, but it was three people that in my head that could have done it. But in my heart, I believe I knew who did it. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, wow. yeah. So, so that was my first reality check. And I think I might have had that car under six months. That's wild. Yeah. That's wild. So, wild. So, yeah, that is wild. Um, yeah. Did I go on with my day? Did I get high that night? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the that's the addict, right? Like, what? Let me. My car just got set on fire. Let me take the the sting away um, from just losing my car, right? Yeah, I was scared. I was definitely scared, um, of course. Because you think that that's, that that was a warning shot for you? Yeah, I felt like um, I didn't do anything to anybody. The one thing I did think was I felt like God was trying to just get my attention. Honestly, of course. Um, there was a a credit card transaction thing that somebody tried to get me to do. And then when I saw it going bad, I dipped, but I left the cards because I didn't want to get caught running with it. Mm -hmm. So I left it and they kind of, there was like $80,000 on each card. And all I was to do was to go to the mall and test them out to make sure that they were functioning. Um, but when I saw security kind of like bum rushing the whole, like I saw it happening and I just slid them under a, a magazine that was on a counter and I dipped out and I said, if they catch me, they're not going to catch the evidence. Right. And so we left. I was like, and then he confronted me that night. He came to my house like, where's the cards? Yeah, yeah. I know you said what happened. Where's the credit cards? I said, I left them. And he didn't believe me. And I kind of felt like, you know, because they was real gangster. And I was like, well, maybe he did it. You know, and then there was this guy who was really obsessed, obsessed with me. And because I love the drugs more than I loved him. I thought maybe it was him. And then I had a, a ex-boyfriend who borrowed my car like a couple days before. And then when he brought my car back, the whole side of my Mazda was sideswiped. Mm. And then he called me and said, hey, I'm leaving the car downstairs at the job. Um, I, I got to take the next flight out. And I was like, what? But he brought the keys upstairs and he left. So I was like, maybe they followed him. So it was three scenarios and I still don't know to this day who did it. I mean, that, that's the, the kind of wild life. I was, I was going to say, I mean, the fact that you got wild. three completely mutually wild. exclusive individuals that potentially could have, you know, put your set your car on fire wild. speaks volumes to where you were at in your life at the time, right? Cor- there you go. Correct. Yeah. Insane. Insane. <laughs> insane. 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 So, so, so turn the page for us, Lunik. What, what, what does it look like for you? You, you, you now at least have some realization as to, you know, what's going on uh i'm assuming you you know you may be trying to figure out a way at some point to 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 move yourself in a different direction what did you do at this point how did you start moving in down a path that ultimately got you to where you are today we'll get into all of that but what did, what was the turning point um i started hanging out with people different people um in the workspace i had gotten a different position um, and then I started hanging out, dabbling in the music industry again, because I'd left, it came back and I really enjoyed that. And they didn't, the people I was hanging around, they drank at casually in restaurants. They weren't getting high. They weren't smoking. And I kind of liked that. And I would go like, I would find myself two days not using, I really wanted to stop. And then every time you stop, you go harder when you pick it back up, mm-hmm. you know, for those of you that do know. Um, and then, um, One day I was just sick. I was sick and tired. I was tired. I was tired. I was sick of me and I knew I needed to do something. And I I really prayed. I used to always pray. I also prayed sometimes for every time I picked up the drug that it wasn't poison and that I wouldn't die from it. I prayed like that, like, God, please don't let me die from this. And I also used to pray, God, please, I want to stop using. At the end of the road, that's what my prayers were. I said, God, if you would just help me, I just want to stop. I can't stop on my own. I've tried. I've tried. It's not working. What, What should I do? And I was sitting up in my uncle's office. I started working there. Um, I was working there and I remember running downstairs and I picked up the phone and I started dialing 411 and, and looking through a phone book. This is phone book era. Right. And I'm like, 
this was the last phase of phone book era. Uh, and I, or everything was like not in, not in business anymore. So I think the phone book was outdated. Like that was already, a, 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 but I didn't know. I prayed and that's where I felt God led me. Because mm-hmm. everything I called in the phone book didn't exist anymore. So I was like, how old is this thing? <laughs> and it was really old. And I was like, oh, girl. And I don't know what made me think of a phone book. And then I started dialing 411. And I was like, can you please put me in touch with any rehabilitation centers for narcotics in the area? And I finally got to um, a, comp- a place called Turning Point in Secaucus. Okay. And the lady was like, Oh, well, we don't, what's the problem? I started telling her, I said, if I, if I, if I don't get into a rehab, I knew nothing about rehabs. I had never heard of a rehab. I did hear my sister say, you need to get some help. You need to go and, you know, but she never said how no one ever said you got a problem. This is what you do about it. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. so I was like, there has to be a drug program. And that's what I was looking for in the phone book, like drug programs or whatever. And that, that's the name rehab and stuff came up. So, I called the place called Turning Point. It was in Secaucus. Um, and the guy, you know, they were like, they don't have no beds. I said, if you guys do not get me into a facility or sign me up or come pick me up or something, I'm not going to make it till tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, hold on. He came back to the phone um, and he said, okay, what type of drugs are you saying? And he said, if I can get you a bed, what you have to do is you have to go to a place and I don't know where, but you got to bring me, they got to sign off on a dirty urine mm-hmm. and they have to fax it by 5 PM today. Got in my car dashed and I called, made a couple phone calls. I looked, Oh, he gave me two phone numbers and one of them actually worked. Mm. He said, I don't know if these two places are still, you know, doing this, but there was a place in Newark on William street. I went down there. The line was long. The whole room was full. I walked right up to the counter. This, this guy standing there. And I said, hi, sir. I need to give a dirty urine before 5 o'clock. He goes, so does everybody else. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> but they really didn't have to give dirty urines. I just, I said, listen, this is my situation. Blah, blah. And he took my hand and he gave me a cup. He made me go pee. And I gave it back to him. And she was like, Whoa. And he signed off on it and he faxed it. And then he said, after he does it, call me. So I called a cousin of mine and I told her, I said, meet me at this place because I have to give a dirty urine. I want to talk. I feel like I need to talk to somebody. And she was like my ride or die. So she kind of came with me. She was like, what is going on? I said, this is what's going on. I'm finally going to check myself in to a rehab. And she said, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. Mm. Um, And then the next day, that night, Oh, honey, I got higher than I've ever gotten in my life. I was so high, I had a headache. Because I was like, this is the last hurrah. I'm going to have a party. Mm. So I went up to, after I got my dirty urine, I got everything I needed. I got in my car. I went uptown. I copped. Probably bought like $400 worth of drugs. Who does that? And like, So I did it. And um, I probably I smoked all night while I was packing. I started packing at like 4 in the morning. Men, I think, no, at like 11 p.m., I called my cousin, my sister, and I said, I need you to drop me off somewhere in the morning at 6 a.m. And she asked me where, and I told her rehab, and she said, hallelujah. And she said, girl, I'll be there. I'm canceling everything. Hmm. So she picked me up in the morning. She took me to the rehab. And it was so funny because I packed the books. I packed a pillow, a big old teddy bear, a notebook and pen, things I hadn't done in years and, you know, I went to the rehab. I checked myself in. I got there. I was there for 28 days. Mm. And when I came out, I was clean. Wow. I mean, that's an amazing um, series of events. I mean, you, you, you went through the yellow pages, through the phone book, found some numbers, miraculously, you know, identified what, one, one of them. Worked. One of them. You know, talk to one gentleman who gave you two numbers of which one of them worked mm-hmm. um, and, you know, had your your cousin, you know, there to support you. And then, you know, four hundred dollars, you know, of, of cocaine later, you check yourself into a rehab for 28 mm-hmm. days and you came up. Yep. 
So I've I, I've I've never you know I've never done cocaine. I don't know what coming off and trying to put your life together looks like. Um, you know, mm-hmm. after having been on on cocaine, being quote unquote clean at that stage, you're now having to kind of just deal with the fallout of of your you know your life up until that point, right? Are you still having cravings for the substance? I'm assuming you got it. No, change. after the t- no, I was actually once I got out the program, I was actually frightened because the way of life that I knew and every day that was my life that had become my life. So yeah. when I got out the 28 day program, I called my sister. She picked me up. She dropped me off. I still had my apartment. Um, the only thing I didn't have was my car. The car was what happened to my car? I can't remember, but I always had a car. I think the car was the battery might've been dead or something, but she dropped me off and I called her right back. She took me to get something to eat on the way home. She dropped me off. I was so scared. Like I was like, so what do I do now? But they did say, as soon as you get home, make a meeting. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you need to take me to make a meeting. And they had already equipped me with the pamphlet. And I looked for one. She took me to a meeting. She dropped me off. And she picked me up. No, she dropped me off at the meeting. I said, don't worry about it. I'm going to get home. Because that's what they said. They said, if you could get a ride, believe me, somebody's going to volunteer to take you home. And I didn't know anything about NA Narcotics Anonymous. You know, I didn't know anything about the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. But Narcotics Anonymous saved my life. Um, My sponsor, having a sponsor saved my life. Having a relationship with God saved my life. Um, Being able to admit that I had a problem. um, That's the first step, you know, and, and wanting to do something about it really was key, you know, to getting the help that I needed. And none of this would have worked if I wasn't open to doing the work that they, you know, that they advised me to do. So I went to a meeting. Then the next day, that night, she picked me up and, no, somebody dropped me off at her house. And I probably spent like maybe four days at my sister's house because I just didn't know how to be. Mm. I didn't know what to do because I, you know, again, it was like I, I felt like a baby crawling, you know, and learning how to walk again for the first time. And I was able to stay clean. I got my 90 day pin. And then um, my best friend came around. I was July, August, September, October. She came around October around her birthday. And we hadn't seen each other in so long. And she was like my vice. She was like my trigger. Mm-hmm. And she, I was telling her, she's like, oh, you're clean. I had just got back to school. I registered for school. I was at Essex County College. I was, it was like a month. I was probably in school 30 days. Um, and then she was like, you know, I want to go hang out. I was like, oh, what do you want to do? And she was like, girl, don't play with me. <laughs> and I was like, no, we're not doing that. So we went and got something to eat. But the whole time she's like antsy, like, what the heck are we doing? This is not what we do, right. you know? And she didn't know that I had went into a rehab. I was telling her, she was like, oh, that's cute. You know, whatever. Right. She didn't know anything about that. And then um, she left. The next day she came back again. I survived one more day. Good for you. She came back the next day. We talked. And off we were to Manhattan. Mm. October, November, December, January. I relapsed for four months. Month five, I got a speeding ticket just randomly just doing life. And I never used again. Wow. Wow. Uh huh. Because I remember that fifth month, I was driving and I was having cravings like you would not believe. I was like, I'm not getting high today. I'm not getting high. It's done. It's over. But I didn't have the will to stop on my own. And I remember stopping at a red light on Sanford Avenue and South Orange Avenue. I left my car running. I opened the door and I ran up the stairs to a church. And I cried out to God and I said, please, please, please remove the taste from my mouth. Hmm. I promise if you just remove the taste from my mouth, I promise to glorify your name all the days of my life. I don't want to smoke crack cocaine no more. Please, please. And I heard, bam, 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 get in your car. So I ran back down to see as the tears in my eyes, dirt all over my knees, my clothes. And I got in my car, I drove off, and I never used it again. Wow. Um you uh you i mean that's amazing uh to hear that and i'm just trying to picture you in that moment running up the stairs to that church and you know and and just having listened to your story on other platforms and now you know getting it you know firsthand from you 
obviously, you know, that's it, this just a, it's such an impactful story. And I'm, and I'm, I'm picturing you, you know, walking up the stairs to this church and, um, you know, and, and having this moment, you know, with, with, with God, um, and, I, and having listened to your story on, on other platforms and now having an opportunity to listen to it firsthand and knowing now why God has placed such a huge you know, part of your life, even to this day, what did that set you off on you know, at that point? I mean, because it seems you certainly had some divine intervention right there to protect you and to hold you, mm-hmm. um, you know, from that point forward. Um, and now here you are 20 years removed from that moment. Um, can you give us the, the audience a line of sight into what continues to propel you today um, in being you know, successful in so many different ways? Not ever wanting to go back to that dark place again. Having to do the work was what kept me clean, honestly. You know, admitting that I was wrong, practicing my faith and really studying um and, and understanding that God loves me, that I am, a, you know, I'm made in his likeness, understanding that God loves me, understanding that God wants more for me than I can ever want for myself, that I am amazing and that I am powerful and I am who God says I am. And I had to really study and I had to embed that. I had to do affirmations. Um, I had to surrender you know, that I didn't know everything. I had to surrender my will and my way and say, well, I tried my way and my way didn't work because every time I put my hands in it, I messed it up. If you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to realize that I had to social distance myself, you know, from people, places and things. I couldn't hang out with her anymore. I couldn't hang out with the people that I used to hang out with because all those people were, triggers for me. That's all we had in common. And when I relapsed with my best friend, I realized at the end of the road, although we've known each other since we were children, I realized at the end of the road, that's all we had in common, Mm. you know, and knowing better, I had to do better. So I had to practice that integrity. And then, um, as I'm practicing integrity, I realized that, you know, the self-acceptance, you know, realizing like, I did wrong. I made mistakes. I made a lot of bad choices. I had to learn to forgive myself, you know, um, forgive other people because I hurt a lot of people. Yeah. Um, the humility part was big for me. I had to humble myself and realize like, you don't know everything. Yes. Get a sponsor, get the help that you need. Um, and just the steps of narcotics anonymous really helped me, you know, um, I had to right my wrongs, like, you know, make amends with people that I hurt. But at the end of the road, Ray, I realized that I really hurt myself, you know, and and I was able to to mend those relationships. I was able to mend the relationship with my sister. I was able to mend the relationship with my brother. I was able to mend the relationship um, with (laughs) so crazy because when I got out the 28 day program, I went back to the relationship that I had tarnished with my ex-boyfriend. He was my ex-boyfriend at the time. He was away in college. I was here using, and he didn't know the excessiveness of how I was using. Mm -hmm. Um, I went into the 28-day program and wrote him a letter while I was there. I had to admit to him while I was there what was going on with me and what I had done. And every time I emptied your bank account, that's what I did. That's what was happening. And... You know, they say they tell us in Narcotics Anonymous that it's okay that those people don't forgive you, give them their grace and give them their space, but work on your relationship with yourself. And as people see you doing better and that you're changing, then that's what they become attracted to again, or they see that you're making a difference or that you actually are changing and not just talking. And I remember him mailing, writing me back. And I was so shocked, but I didn't know what to expect from the letter. And he taped the keys to the house, to that letter and said, I'm here, come home whenever you're ready. And it was a first class ticket waiting for me to come home. Hmm. And I thought that that was the most powerful thing because through him, I learned the power of forgiveness. I was like, wow, that was big because he had a really big heart. But I was able to get myself in a space where... um, I started going back to church again. 
um, not practicing religion, but just, I had hope. I had a lot of hope and I started giving back. You know, I started um, laughing again because laughter became my medicine. I love laughing. Like when I laugh, I mean, I really laugh out loud. I don't care who, and I'm like, you know, people always say, shh. I'm like, if you guys knew what I've been through, you would be so happy that I'm laughing. You'll be like, mm-hmm. wow, now I know why she's laughing. You know, because it was a time where I didn't laugh. It was nothing funny. You know, um, now I can hear the birds chirping. You know, I can hear things that are like happening around me, things that I ignore because everything was about the mission of of, of the getting high. And I'm just grateful that I have a relationship with Christ, that I was able to mend a lot of relationships, that I was able to go back, you know, and start doing the things that I love. I started a business, you know, um, the business is called God is great, you know, and I, and I kept my promise, you know, cause I was facing 10 years in the federal prison, you know, during this time for all the things that I did, you know, to get one more, hmm. you know, a lot of people, um, think that, you know, when I say God is great, I am living proof. It's very powerful. It's a powerful statement. It's my story. It's your story. It's a lot of people's stories, you know, that we're still here to tell the story. And it's only through grace. Yeah. It's only through mercy and favor that we're all here. Yeah. I, I do. I do agree with you on that. I mean, and, and I, and I think you see, so you have that divine grace, right? Which is, which is what you're talking about. And then on the other hand, you also talked about the grace that you started to give yourself uh, in addition to, you know, the other relationships that you've mended and healed intentionally. How long did it take you to get to a point where you were comfortable with yourself and where you were able to give yourself the grace and where you were able to shed some of the potential shame and, you know, and guilt that you were carrying you know, from, from those days, what, what did, were you the first person in line or were you the last person in line? I I guess is what I'm trying to get at here. I was the person throughout because I had to put myself in other people's shoes. Yeah. And I had to say, wow, if you, and it wasn't like hurt where I, I hurt people that loved me and cared about me and wanted to protect me. And I was like, don't tell me what to do. I stayed away. I stopped returning phone calls. I stopped answering my door. Mm. Um, I didn't physically hurt anybody or anything like that. But I knew like when my mom looked at me, her heart was broken, Mm -hmm. you know, and I know that when I crossed that stage at graduation at Montclair State University, my mom was happy. My mom was proud. Um, When the judge gave down that sentence, of house arrests and not the 10 years, my mom was relieved. And I remember saying to the judge, I said, you know, your honor, I'm no prolific speaker, but my mom is a praying woman and she's here in this courtroom today. And I know that I've embarrassed her to the 10th degree. And I just pray that whatever sentence you give down today, I pray that it is in alignment with God and what he has planned for my life. So whatever you're going to say, I'm ready. Hmm. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. And, and I think that was the, the, I started to forgive myself in a way where I was like, I stood up for myself. You know, I, I, I stopped beating myself up because I realized I had to play the tape back. What made me pick up that? first, not the first drug, but the one that took, that propelled me out of control. And when I got with that, there there was a sense of freedom that happened for me. Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't know if it, if it's your, your part of your story as well, but in order to have that moment, you have to confront the pain that got you there in the first place. Oh yeah. (laughs) You know, I'm crying because it's, it's no longer painful. It's actually joy. It's like, wow. Cause I get to play the tape back again. And it's, it's like, I'm, I'm proud that I'm here. You know, it took a lot and I had to do the work because a lot of times we don't like to, we don't have the willingness to do the work. And I realized that anything great worth having, you have to work for it, yep. you know, and I believe that I was worth it. So I fought for me. I love that. I fought and I, and I kept going back to, if I could tell that 13 year old girl 
you know, that was like promiscuous and the wanting to sneak out the house, what would you tell her? And I told her that I loved her. I told her to be careful. I told her to watch out for people that didn't love her. I told her um, a lot of things. Yeah. I told her to stop trying to act like you know everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I talked to her. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I love that. I mean, I do find that, you know, in this journey, and I mean, I'm, I'm three years removed from my own substance and, you know, Amen. I oftentimes find myself, you know, having conversations with that young version of Ray um, and, uh, and trying to impart some like re retrospective, you know, wisdom advice and also just some for forgiveness, right. For the path that, you know, is ahead of that 13, 14 year old Ray and that's, that's tough. You know, that's a tough space to be, but it's such a, um, a gift that one can give oneself, right. Is to have Ooh. that, 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 that dialogue with yourself. And I'll tell you, I don't know if I would, if I would have gotten to this place developmentally, if I hadn't have been through some of the darker days that I have been through in my own life. And I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's what I'm hearing when I hear you Recount, oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. You know, your, your I believe that everything that I had that I've been through, I literally had to go through to become the woman that I am. Mm. I wouldn't take none of it back. And I share this all the time. I tell people like a lot of people that are clean from drug addiction, that are clean from alcohol or sex addiction. I honestly feel like because I have found the drug that I like that chemically like, um, it's like that, and, that, that, that perfect fit, right? Right, right. And I tell people all the time, a lot of addicts don't like to admit if I could continue to get high successfully, I still would. Mm. People it, don't understand, don't it, like to admit that. Yeah, it's the, it's the, I don't want to deal with any of the consequences, both physically, Correct. socially, um, emotionally, you know, emotionally. Yeah. I want to, I, I wish I could use successfully. I'm glad that I don't, but I wish it didn't. Not that I wish I could like right now, right. like I wish I could have and balanced it where it didn't wreck me. Yeah. I think a lot of you folks do I'm that. Saying? I think a lot of yeah. folks do that. Like if you think about, you know, and I don't, again, I'm, I, I, you know, drugs have never been you know, the cocaine, you know, it's never been an issue for me, but at least in alcohol, a lot of folks get to a point where they try to moderate, right? Because they think oh, yeah. that that moderation is going to allow them to be able to, to manage this thing so they can continue to do the thing. Um, mm -hmm. and also, you know, live this other, this, this other life. And for some, maybe that works. I don't know. I've never met anybody that it does who has an actual issue with the substance. Um, it certainly didn't work for me. Um, so I hear you on that. And, and at least for me, I decided, I was like, you know, I, I can't touch this stuff. Cause I, I, right. I you know, seven times out of 10 things are probably okay, mm -hmm. but it's those three, those three times out of 10 where the, where the, the, the car goes totally off the road. And I don't know, you know, where it's going to end up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know where it's going to end right. up. Um, right. I always say we got to do the work, though, the internal work. We got to dig and we got to figure out like what's going on emotionally. What did we do or what did we not tap into that we're not comfortable talking about? That's why therapy was huge because I was I was sent to therapy by the judge, mm. you know, um, because she asked. I broke the story down. I wrote her a letter and I told her what my issues were, why I was using and why I did some of the things, things, things that, that I was being accused of, you know, and she got me the help that I needed. And that was part of my sentencing, if yep. you will. And I was grateful for it, you know, but I think um, once I got to the root and was able to talk about it and to actually, cause I still go into the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous okay. and I raise my hand. My name is Lunik and I'm an addict and I share where I am because what happens is as addicts, we replace one for another. Mm. We don't like to admit it, but now I'm like a whole beast at, at my business. You know, I I'd rather, I'm glad that I found a place where I can explore and put this energy, you know? Um, but they also say the quote, um, the way you do one thing is how you do everything. Right. So um, I really believe that, but I like the way I channel my energy. And I like the fact that I have somewhat of a balance now where I can go to an NA meeting or I can do a podcast like this, or um, I could call my sponsor and have a conversation with her. I can go to church and I can release, I can meditate, you know, 
um, and have these moments of like, you know, numb your whole renge kill. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, lo- I love but, that. For, yeah, for, the, for those yeah. out there who don't know, that is a Tina Turner reference. Yes, uh, <laughs> from a movie right? Right, of her meditating. Yeah. Right. Um, I love that. Uh, I, we're we're going to... So if if no one if you've caught anything from this from this episode for those who are listening god certainly is great uh and i and i want to highlight god is great apparel as well so we'll include the link obviously mm-hmm. to your to your line in the show notes uh because you've turned into you know quite the entrepreneur and you know quite the you know the 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 advocate for for spirituality um, as well, I read somewhere that you were practicing to be a minister. I don't know if you actually have become one. I am. I'm okay. actually. I'm licensed. Yeah, I'm a licensed minister. Um, I'm waiting. Not waiting, but I believe I was supposed to be ordained as a reverend. But there's some transitional things that's happening at my church, so that may or may not happen. But I know that when God, if God qualifies me, man can't not stop what God has for me. So I am a preacher. I okay. am definitely a preacher. I preach. You know, I study to show myself approved and, you know, I do a lot of praying. I have um, I have like a community push, press, pray that okay. we've been building and working on. And I'm also, you know, trying to finish up the book because I want to be able to tell this story. Yeah, well, yeah. We, we all gonna, we're going to keep our, our eyes and, and ears open uh, for the book. And, and, and obviously, before we leave, I'll make sure that you, you leave um, where everyone can can find you. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I do have one question for you, Lunik. Actually, two questions. One of which you already, mm-hmm. uh, you know, answered somewhat. Uh, it's okay. a little bit of a, a fastball, and then a softer one. The first one is in those kind of darkest days that you experienced in the height of your addiction. How did how would the folks around you have known that you were struggling so um, without you explicitly telling them so? My behavior, my language, how I speak. It was the I don't care attitude um I was 160 pounds 50 pounds I was very healthy you know I I, my body was like you know I was an athlete and once you get you know you work out and you have that you all it's kind of go stays with you and the weight loss the face drawn you know, my face was nine now I'm fat. You know, I'm just a little thick, a little thick, too thick. So it's, it's healthy. <laughs> but, you, it's right. quite healthy. <laughs> but I started to lose a lot of weight and my behavior was different. The people I was around was different. Because I'm used to being around a lot of good energy and good vibes. And, you know, my I would be in my room getting high, would black out my curt my windows like mm-hmm. it's so sick. I was so sick. Well, yeah, that's 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 a, a, a in the rearview mirror for you, though. F- fortunately, I love to hear that part of it for sure. I became a, I was a size zero. Who wouldn't notice that? Wow! Literally, I was wow. a size zero. Literally. Wow! Thank you for 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 sharing, and I think that ultimately that's for the person sitting there saying to themselves, "I think I might have an issue as as well um, that I that I need to address." Uh, but in this year of 2024, with so much out there, I don't even know what my first step is going to be. What would you suggest right. to that person? Uh, first, let me say this. We all get a turn, right? We all have something that we're dealing with, but we can't beat ourselves up about it, right? I think if we just decide or even have the courage to want to get better or deal with whatever is going on with us, because sometimes the relationship is aggravating or you feel down that's just the top layer that's just the surface yep. you know we we don't understand that we have some real trauma that's been passed down to us like when our parents were pregnant and they were going through trauma that stuff is passed down genetically and I don't think we understand the power of that you know it's like if we were molested or we were abandoned or we have daddy issues or we have mommy issues or we have relationship, you know, um, incest issues, those things play a huge role because our parents didn't go to therapy. Yep. You know, I think it's important that we visit the idea of going to therapy and therapy is not for crazy people. Although all, most of us are crazy, right? It's not just for crazy people. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be is, human beings if we didn't have a little craziness. Right. Right. <laughs> and I think it's, it's important to give yourself grace 
You know, it's important to, even if you don't, um, nobody's told you that they love you. Tell yourself that they, that you love you. Embrace yourself. When you hug someone, hug them wholeheartedly. Or if you think you're in need of a hug, tell somebody, I need a hug. Yeah. You know, like, can you hug me? Because sometimes people hug you and they think that, that, you know, uh, they're, they're giving you a hug. They're giving you a hug, and but they don't realize that you're reciprocating or they're getting something out of it too. And I just think that the beauty in all of this is that you are all right and you can be okay. You have to want to be okay and you have to want to do the work and you have to want to get the help. Don't beat up on yourself. Give yourself grace. You know, like you made a mistake. You are not your mistake. You are not your parents' mistake. Like you are important to Christ. You are important to God, Allah, the universe, whatever you want to call him. You have great purpose on your life. You are important. The thing that you went through is not simply just for you. I didn't go through all of this darkness and all of this drugs and all of the rehabs. It wasn't just for me. It was literally to give somebody else hope. Yeah. So that I can now help somebody else and then they could turn around and they can reciprocate it and they can continue and keep the ball rolling. Because none of us, you know, are perfect and we need each other. I I totally agree with you on 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 all of that. Um, Thank you so much. I want to make sure that folks know where to find you, Lunik, once we once we put this out. So could you share where folks can find uh, the apparel brand, where they can find you and your motivational uh, messaging and, and anything else that you're working on? Sure. Um, so my name is Lunik Addison Boyd. I am an entrepreneur. I'm also a minister. Um, I am also a serial entrepreneur. I do many things, but one of the things that I do that I love the most is I love serving. That's what I do. And God is great. Apparel is a service, you know, um, God is great. Apparel.com is the website. So God is great. Apparel is the website. God is great. Apparel on Instagram. God is great. Apparel on Facebook. And my personal um, Instagram and Facebook is I am Lunic the Messenger. I A M L U N I C the Messenger. And yeah, that's how you can find me. Well, Lunic, thank you so much for bringing your story and your message to the Stacking Days podcast. Um, I really appreciate uh, you know getting a chance to chat with you. I got to get my hands on uh, some of your apparel so that I can just so I can wear it while I'm I'm on yeah. on, on the show here. So I'll, I'll reach yeah, out yeah. separately uh, for that. But uh, but thank you so much for for spending some time. Really do appreciate it. Okay. Absolutely. And I pray that you guys will find me during the holidays. I'm looking for a local pop-up in New Jersey because we closed our store in Livingston Mall back in February. So we're strictly online and that's GodIsGreatPower.com. Thank you so much, Ray. I enjoyed our conversation. It was good. You got it. You <laughs> I got hope it. it was helpful. Oh, I think so. Guys, go find go find God is Great, uh, especially for the holidays coming up. And, uh, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Stacking Days. And uh, please, until then, be well one day at a time. Peace. I appreciate you guys listening to the Stacking Days podcast. I hope this episode added value to your recovery and wellness journey. Before we go our separate ways, let's connect on social. You can find us on TikTok and Instagram at Stacking Days or via the website www.stackingdays.com. By supporting the show, you can play a direct role in amplifying people of color in their pursuit of recovery. The easiest way to do that is to subscribe or hit the follow button. This way, you'll never miss an episode, all while playing an active part in creating the ecosystem where diverse voices and healing matter. This show is for the purpose of education and connection and is not a replacement for therapy or recovery care. For more information on the resources and support available, take a look at SAMHSA and some other resources shared in the description. Until we meet again, be well, one day at a time.